Okay, uh, I think we're ready to get started. Um, so we're here to talk about uh, interop interoperable networking in OpenStack uh, via DEF Core. Um, my name is Mark Velker. I'm the OpenStack architect at VMware, and I'm also a member of the DEF Core committee. Hello. Okay. Hi, I'm Kyle Mestri. I'm a distinguished engineer at IBM, and I'm on the OpenStack technical committee. Hey, and I'm, I'm Russell Bryan. I'm a senior principal engineer at uh, Red Hat, and I'm on the OpenStack technical committee and also the OpenStack foundation board of directors. Um, so a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, for those of you that are new to DEF Core, it's a fairly new thing for most people in the community. Um, just to be kind of became uh, prevalent in most people's minds around the Vancouver summit. Um, so we'll do a little explanation of what DEF Core is about, uh, just kind of level set for the rest of the conversation today. Um, and then we'll talk about what interoperable networking means in, in terms of uh, DEF Core and in terms of um, the capabilities that OpenStack exposes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some history, about how we got to where we are today and why we're in the mess that we're in and how we're uh, trying to straighten it out. Um, we'll go through uh, the Nova Net uh, and Neutron uh, conundrum, um, and then we'll talk about what has actually been proposed to the board of directors um, and that will be voted on in, in three months. Um, and then talk about how you can engage in that conversation um, and supply your own feedback about the, the uh, proposed capabilities. Before everyone starts, I was just curious, has everyone heard of DEF Core or does everyone knows what it is? Okay. Or a little bit at least. I mean, I, I was just... <laughs> Does everybody know what networking is? It was Winger, actually, but close. <laughs> okay, um, so quick level set on DEF Core. Um, we'll try to keep this short. There's a, a lot of nuance here that I'll gloss over, but um, if you want to pick my brain, find me in the hallway and we'll, we'll uh, talk your head off. Um, the DEF Core committee uh, essentially is a body that's created by the uh, Stack Foundation's board of directors. Um, its essential goal is to create what we call guidelines. A guideline is basically a document um, that states that products that want to use the OpenStack name or that want to use the OpenStack powered logo um, have to expose certain capabilities to their end users. Um, so basically the guideline consists of a list of those capabilities, the tests that you must pass in order to prove that you expose those capabilities, uh, and then also a list of designated sections. And designated sections just basically say that if you're exposing a capability, you should be using OpenStack code to do it. Um, and the, the essential uh, thing there is just that you can't go write OpenStack in Java uh, and call it OpenStack, because that's not what we are. Um, at the end of the day, um, products that want to um, use either OpenStack in their product name or that want to get that logo at the bottom of the slide there uh, from the foundation um, have to uh, adhere to this. Um, sort of the, the sort of end user case for this um, is that all those capabilities can be counted on uh, if you're using any product that bears that logo. Um, so if I want to run a workload on multiple clouds or multiple cloud products, as long as it has that logo, I know there are certain capabilities that I can depend on being there uh, and exposed to me. Um, so obviously that brings up the question of how do we pick what capabilities go into those guidelines and then we require vendors to expose, whether a public cloud or a, a distribution or a managed service. Um, DEF Core has 12 criteria uh, for selecting those capabilities, and this is kind of what that looks like. They're kind of lumped into four, um, four categories. Um, it's... If you look at um, kind of what's on the slide here, you can see that these are mostly trailing indicators of acceptance. So, for example, we don't in include something in DevCore's guidelines until it's widely deployed. Um, so it's not like, you know, the minute a new feature comes out, it goes into DevCore, um, because it actually has to be um, accepted by the end user community uh, before it goes in there. Um, some of the more esoteric features that projects expose that a lot of people don't use are also probably not good candidates for DevCore for that very reason. Um, uh, I won't uh, belabor this because we could probably talk for half an hour uh, on just these uh, 12 criteria, uh, but I did want to at least give folks kind of an idea of, of what this looks like from a DevCore perspective. Uh, and again, there's, there's a whole uh, uh, wiki page that you can go through that kind of explains each one of these in a lot more detail, and the links are at the end of the slide, and we'll put those uh, up on SlideShare for you to, to grab later. Um, so a couple of, cu couple of important points. Um, first of all, DevCore only covers capabilities that are actually exposed to end users. So there's a lot of things in OpenStack that are considered admin-only APIs, for example, uh, or there are things that happen kind of on the back end that the user never sees. Uh, so for example, you wouldn't see DEF Core making requirements around, um, say, uh, RPC messages, because end users never see those. Uh, for the same reason, when we get to uh, provider networks in Neutron, those are generally an admin-only thing. Uh, so if a user can't actually use a capability, it doesn't go into the DEF Core guidelines. This is really about uh, end users. Um, kind of at the end of the day, um, if, I'm a, if I have a tenant account in a cloud, I should be able to run all the tests that are required for DEF Core. And that's all I should need. Um, 
having more than one way to do something is actually okay. Um, like the classic use case we see for this is when a project has more than one version of an API. Um, so maybe if I want to uh, upload images into a cloud, I could use either the Glance V1 or the V2 API. Uh, that's, that's actually okay from DevCore perspective. Um, what we care about is that they meet those 12 criteria um, and that they're, they're uh, actually exposed to end users. Um, and the, the sort of line there is it's okay to offer users choice. Um, we just want the, the choices that they have to be dependable. Um, we mentioned that DevCore is already a trailing indicator. Um, kind of one of the big things to understand there is that every guideline that DevCore produces covers three OpenStack releases, uh, the most recent three uh, OpenStack releases. Um, so that means that a capability won't go into the DevCore guidelines until it's actually been present in three OpenStack releases. Um, that gives it time to mature and, and meet all those other criteria as well. Um, also, when we add new capabilities to the guidelines over time, um, there's actually kind of a waiting period. So we have to put them into advisory status for six months, um, and then the next guideline, they can actually be required. The purpose of that is basically to give vendors a heads up that something is coming and is going to be required in the future and give them time to make adjustments to their products if they need to. Um, so if I'm a public cloud, um, you know, I may have to change configs or, or get ready to expose new things to a user. That could sometimes mean pretty involved work on the back end. Um, I may have to you know, deal with storage issues or I may have to deal with network redesign issues, those kinds of things. Um, so the purpose of the six month period there is to give all the vendors a heads up and also give users a chance to chime in as well. Um, so in terms of interoperable networking, um, realistically for most people today, what we probably have to have uh, to have interoperable networking is basic L2, L3, uh, and external connectivity. Um, so those are really the things that we, we kind of focused in on for this first round uh, of DEF Core. Um, this is uh, the first time that we're actually going to have any requirements around networking in DEF Core. Um, so, you know, baby steps, right? Uh, we can get to more advanced stuff later, but this is where we have to start. Um, and just to mention again, we care how these are exposed to end users. We don't really care how they're implemented on the back end. So we really don't care if, you know, you're uh, building networks with VXLAN or VLANs or, or whatever else. That's an implementation detail that should be completely hidden from the user. We basically care that that API call works uh, and returns a thing that users can use. Um, the problem is that there's lots of different ways to provide connectivity in OpenStack today. Um, there's provider networks, but that's an admin-only construct. Um, you can directly attach instances to an externally routable network. Um, users don't necessarily have a way to find out that that is an externally routable network unless each vendor tells them so. Um, so if I'm writing a workload that's designed to run on multiple clouds, that can be kind of challenging. Um, there's floating IPs, um, which is kind of a, a matter of debate even in the greater industry outside of OpenStack. Um, Amazon has kind of been getting away from that model, and DigitalOcean actually just recently announced that they're adopting floating IPs. Um, so there's, there's kind of a lot of debate in the, in the industry at large, not just within OpenStack. Um, and then we also have uh, a new API proposal uh, in Neutron, um, which Kyle will talk about in just a minute. Um, one more thing to, to kind of level set the conversation here. When we talk about networking, remember, we're, we're kind of starting at baby steps, right? And we're also looking at stuff that is very widely deployed in OpenStack clouds today. Um, so we're not including IPv6 in the discussion today just because um, although we can all see that IPv6 is an important thing that we should be paying attention to, it's just not widely deployed in a lot of uh, OpenStack installations today. Uh, so that's kind of on the sidelines for the time being. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that clouds can't offer IPv6. It just means that they have to offer IPv4 as well. Um, uh, we're also focused on L2 and L3 here, so we're not going to get into the, the L4 through L7 services. All right, so let's talk about a, a little bit of background, some history. So there was a time where, where Neutron wasn't a thing, or, or Quantum, or any such uh, alternative to Nova Network. And so you know, when OpenStack started, we had Nova Network, and it was simple um, and, and, and quite limited, but it just worked, uh, which, was, which was fantastic. Um, and it was not at least intentionally pluggable, it's just software, so it turns out you could go put your own code in there if you want to, but that really wasn't the goal. It was, you know, here, we're just a very basic, straightforward way to provide networking to your cloud. And, uh, you know, that was that was the way we did things. So uh, if you jump to the next slide here, you know, what the Nova Network did, uh, it had, uh, you could do flat networks, optionally with OpenStack providing DHCP on, the, on that network, um, or you can do really, really basic tenant isolation using VLANs, and the tenants didn't have any control over that. Uh, but uh, we could do uh, some some super basic tenant isolation. There's no no support for overlapping address support. That's a big thing in Neutron. You know, t uh, every tenant uh, may want to you know create create networks using the same private I uh, IP address space, but you couldn't do that in Nova. Um, and there's no you know no su no support for integration with your physical fabric. That's you know some 
and, and, and well, many other things that Neutron can do uh, that just Nova didn't do. It was just, um, just, just, just really simple. And it used IP tables for security groups, which is pretty common in the Neutron case. And it had uh, both a central and a multi-host mode for providing external connectivity. But that was it. Uh, there was there was n there's no sort of uh, concept of of SDN controllers. No integration with any sort of uh, c you know uh, any of these newer alternatives. So if we think about uh, Nova Network from an, an interop perspective, it was actually really good from an, inter an interop perspective, which is part part of what makes this whole thing um, difficult. Because like you know through through the development of OpenStack, we sort of have to balance this innovation angle with the fact that we actually want to so at some point provide some sort of Reasonably standardized thing that you that you, that you get everywhere you go when you use OpenStack. So we kind of we have this this balance. But um, so you know in the Nova Network days you had ver you know very little options, um, which was great for interop. But but the reality is people actually want more choice. The industry's uh, coming up with new and better ways to to do networking, to do virtual networking, and you know we want to make that possible with OpenStack. And so the reality is that the neutron is the way forward, and so now we need to, to sort of take that innovation but still figure out how to provide something that, that is standardized and, and, and can, can be included in, in the rules we use for interoperability. Okay, so, so now we can talk a little bit about neutron, now that we have the background of Nova Networks and where we're at as well. And I think, I think one, of the, one of the biggest things that that Neutron provides is the ability for tenants to create and connect their networks and subnets, which, which is, so this is like Mark was saying, this becomes a user-facing API, so this, this is something that the DEF core now wants to get involved with so we can kind of figure out a way of, of what of all of these different APIs we want to, we want to put under the purveyance of DEF core, I think, a little bit. But, but, you know, the problem is drivers can implement this in many different ways on the back end. Maybe not so much a problem as long as the user-facing API is there and the semantics of the API are honored by all the different drivers, I think. So that's pretty good. Um, one of the really big things that, that the team kind of focused on over the Kilo and Liberty cycles, and really a lot of it was done in Liberty, was documentation around this. Uh, because it turns out that, that with regards to Nova Network, um, there was a large swath of people that really liked the flat mode of Nova Network and were not aware that you could, you could do that with Neutron as well. And so that's one of the things that we ended up documenting was, was that particular mode in particular. So, so now people who were using that and maybe wanted to deploy a new cloud and wanted the same behavior of their flat network could do it with provider networks on Neutron as well. So that was, that was actually a really, really huge thing. And it was odd that there was like a communication gap, I think, there for a long while that we finally solved at the Vancouver summit. And yeah, there's, and then, there's just this, this big assumption that yeah. just because Neutron could do yeah. the, these more advanced and, and more, uh, you know, it, it more advanced things that were exposed to end users, that that was the way you right. use Neutron when it turned out you can actually scale it back and do something just like, just like Nova Network. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's, now it's well documented and we've seemed to be clearing up some, that misconception. It was really huge actually. Yeah. So then beyond that, though, um, Neutron does provide you a pretty rich API to, to build things um, like networks, subnets, and ports. And you can, as a user using the API, you can construct some pretty complex topologies using that and build different things. And that's great. There's a lot of people that really like that, that use that to build these topologies, allow their users of their cloud products to do that. There's another group of people that, that still really want something really simple. So for example, if you, if you want to boot a VM and maybe get connectivity for that VM, both inside and outside, there's a lot of things with Neutron you have to kind of do to get that up and running. You know, you have to create networks, subnets, you have to boot the VM, you might need a floating IP, things like this. So one of the things that, that, we, that we looked at during Liberty um, was this, what's been termed, get me a network. And it, it really is just as simple as, look, you know, I just want a network. I just want a network for my machine. I just want the VM to come up. I wanted to have a connectivity and, and just get me a network. And so we, we iterated on this a bit during Liberty. We never, I mean, we merged the spec, the work. You know, we, I think there was a version of the patch towards the end that came out, but it was more of a proof of concept type of thing. So, so that, that, that really is something that we're looking at for Mataka now, and I think the team is really prioritizing that to get that done. Um, our own uh, infrastructure team, I know, really wants that. The OpenStack Infra team, for example, because one of the infra clouds they're building, they just want to be able to put 
VMs right on public networks without using floating IPs. And so this would allow them to do that in a nice user supported way. So, so that's what we're going to do. And this kind of leads into the next thing, which is this discussion of the technical trade offs of floating IPs. Uh, you know, what is a floating IP or a FIP, as it's kind of known around? I really love the FIP terminology better personally. But so, what is a floating IP? So it, it's an IP that's assigned on an external neutron network. Um, and, and you can actually use NAT to get to it. So what that typically means is if a tenant, as you create, if you create a network, typically your, those will be like some sort of private address space that that network will get from, that, from the subnet that's associated with that network. So you can get outside because we, we do you know, NAT to get out, but if you want to get back into that VM, say you want to get traffic into the VM, you can assign the floating IP address to that as well. And so the reality with floating IPs is they are great for some workloads. A lot of people do like them. I think like Mark said, DigitalOcean is now going to support them at the same time as maybe other providers are not going to. So there's, there's really no, there's no consensus around, yes, you absolutely have to have them for your cloud or you don't, I think. So I think that this kind of leads us into the fact that there are lots of different ways to do networking. Um, if you sit in on any of the Neutron Design Summit sessions, you might notice that there are lots of different ways, lots of vendors, different ways of providing connectivity, I think. So there, there really is a demand kind of for this get me a network spec, though, I think. So, so we're going to figure that out. But I think like the slide says, even when we get that in, it's going to be a long time before we could kind of mandate it in DEF core. Right. And, and Mark kind of went over why that is. So Yeah, it goes back to the point that, you know, we have to have something, the capability has to be exposed in the most three recent releases of OpenStack before we can actually put it in the, the standard. And even once it is, has been present for three releases, it still has to meet all the other criteria. So people actually have to have adopted it and used it in the wild uh, before we can actually stick it in there. Um, so it could be a while before something like this actually makes its way into the, into the DEF Core guidelines. Right. So that's, so even if we get it in, it's you know realistically going to be the the P release before, assuming it's actually deployed and everything. So and then the the floating IP conundrum as well. I think an early version of one of these patches for DefCore mm -hmm. had floating IPs in it, and very harmlessly was put in there, and a bunch of people liked it. And then the negative one fairies came out and and just you know destroyed it. I think yeah. and you know that was it because there was there was like people didn't like the floating IPs eventually. Yeah. I think so. Th so the reality is is. I don't, well, I don't want to spoil anything from your future slides, but yeah, yeah, we'll, the future we'll of floating IPs, then. we'll talk about that soon. Sure. <laughs> All right, so speaking of what's currently proposed, um, this is where you can find that thing. So um, the link at the top of the page there um, is a link to the spec that was just presented to the board of directors on Monday of this week. Um, and that is a proposed spec. So we have now come out to the community and said, all right, we've done our scoring. This is what we think needs to go in there. Um, community, please come comment. Um, and there's three months before the vote board will actually vote to approve it. Um, so it's basically there's three months for um, you, the community, to chime in and, and you know, put in your, your two cents into the bucket. Um, and I'll, I'll have a link in a minute to a uh, review where you can actually go do that. Um, basically, it includes four buckets of, capabili of capabilities is advisory. Um, remember that we have to have the advisory period before it actually comes required. Um, so there's basic L2 operations. This is stuff like creating networks, reading ne listing networks, uh, updating networks, deleting networks. Uh, same thing for L3. Um, we also include routers in that, um, which allow tenants to create routers and uh, you know, connect uh, isolated uh, L2 networks. Um, we also have security groups and floating IPs. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about floating IPs in, in a minute or two here. Um, L2, L3, and security groups, the early feedback that we got when we were going through the scoring phase on this um, was pretty, people pretty much were OK with all those capabilities. Um, there's a little bit of discussion about routers, but um, not very much. Um, so those seem like they're pretty likely at this point to land as, as required in a future spec. Um, floating IPs, on the other hand, was a bit more controversial. Um, so if you look, read the proposal that was on the last slide, uh, floating IPs are currently in there, uh, but it seems pretty likely at this point that there's not enough consensus and that they'll probably uh, wind up falling out of the spec before it goes up for approval. Um, so that means two things. Uh, one, if you have an opinion about whether you like floating IPs and think we should be able to depend on them or not, you should probably go comment on that spec. Um, so, uh, you know, the, like Kyle said, the, the negative one fairies are out on floating IPs. Um, if you're a plus one fairy, um, now would be a good time to, to speak up. So just like a survey, who, who's in support of floating IPs? Anyone? Do people use I'm raising my IPs hand, better? actually. So yeah, is Russell. Too. Yeah. Anyone else? Really? No one else? I don't else? hate them. I don't know. A few. Yeah. That's 
a good question. Yeah. Last bullet on the slide. Yeah. Um, so basically, there, if we look at how people are actually doing this today, there's enough different ways that different uh, products actually expose it. When I say products, I mean public clouds, distributions, managed services, um, runs the gambit, right? Um, we actually did, uh, Monty Taylor actually went out and surveyed all like 15 public clouds that he has an account on and put some information up about those. And we went through some of the, the individual uh, products as well. Um, and we also looked at some user data from uh, the user yeah. committee as well. Um, when we go through there, it's so like fragmented right now that there really isn't a external connectivity standard. Like floating IPs was our best hope. <laughs> um, and if, if that isn't uh, widely enough adopted, then probably nothing else is right now. Um, what I will say is that um, you know, the, the upside of that is that we, we probably won't be able to have a external connectivity standard uh, way of connecting for quite some time, uh, for at least you know, 18 months, if not more. Um, the, the sort of flip side of that is that kind of galvanized the community behind, wow, that's, that stinks, <laughs> uh, and we should fix that. So that's where um, a lot of momentum has come behind the Get Me Network spec, for example, uh, as a possible route to that. Um, there's also been some discussion about um, how we could have a, maybe a new API call on Neutron. Um, that goes into the back end and figures out, okay, well, the way that this particular cloud is set up is that um, you know, it uses floating IPs. So when I say, get me an IP that has an external connectivity, I will actually go create a floating IP and assign it to that instance. And you know, So it's kind of another uh, layer there. Um, so like I say, um, basically the, the work that we did here in kind of unraveling that whole story and, and actually going out and looking at what people are doing today um, was actually, it, it sparked a pretty healthy conversation about how to, how to do interoperable networking in the future. Um, we figured out that you know, L2, L3 security groups, there's actually pretty good consensus on that. We should be able to, to set that up to where people can rely on those capabilities. Um, external connectivity is hard, and we should go fix that. Um, so now we're kind of in the phase where we're having a good discussion about how we, we go and do that. Um, so again, that, you know, like we just said, there's, there's a good conversation about that going on now, and we'd be interested to hear more from, from people about how that all should work. Um, and so just to reiterate here about why we need that kind of feedback, um, it's not like the user survey can really even ask about this in a way that makes sense, right? Um, and users don't actually know, in a lot of cases, how their provider has set things up. In a lot of cases, if we go look at, you know, say, Red Hat's distribution or Canonical's distribution or VMware's distribution, um, there's actually different ways that an individual customer can set those distributions up. Um, so it's really hard to like, send out a survey and get good feedback on this kind of thing. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, vendors who want to call themselves OpenStack or want to be able to use that logo, um, whatever goes into the spec, they're going to have to expose. Right? Now, their customers can switch it off, uh, unless it's a public cloud, right, where the customer can't actually do that. Um, but they're going to have to uh, expose that capability. So it's kind of a big deal for, for the vendor perspective. Um, and users, on the other hand, want to be able to depend on certain capabilities, and this is the route that gets them to be able to do that. Um, any project that bears that badge, any products that bears that badge, uh, will have these capabilities exposed. Um, if we choose something that has technical implications on the other side, like you know, one of the arguments against floating IPs is that they rely on NAT, and people don't like NAT because it's not performant, right, um, in their minds, for their use cases. Um, so if we were to go with floating IPs people are probably going to have to live with that, right? Because it's hard to do floating IPs and something else within the same compute cloud. Possible, but uh, complicated for the administrator. Um, so how does supply feedback? Um, so this primarily affects OpenStack products, which ultimately offend in, uh, affect end users, maybe offend, uh, affect end users. <laughs> um, so one, way, one channel to do this is if you're using a vendor product, whether it's a public cloud or distribution or, a, I don't know, a consulting shop for all I care, um, it's ultimately pretty good to lean on your vendor a little bit and tell them, look, this is what we want, this is what we don't want, right? Because um, ultimately that trickles back to us as well. Um, use cases are also super helpful. Um, some of the feedback we got during the early phases of drawing all this up was, you know, if, if we include this capability, then use cases X, Y, and Z are broken. Um, so that was good feedback for us to, to be able to understand how things are being used, and that makes us, helps us make better decisions about what capabilities to include. Um, usage data is super, super helpful. Um, there's a tool called RefStack that people use to run these tests uh, when they want to go for a logo certification process with the foundation. Um, anybody who has tenant credentials to a cloud should be able to run those same tests. Um, so if you uh, are a vendor uh, or a user of a cloud and want to go run those tests yourself, you can actually go do that. Those actually get reported anonymously to a site uh, called, uh, well, it was RefStack.net until a couple weeks ago. I think now it's OpenStack.org slash RefStack. 
Um, but that actually gets reported into a central repository. And the more of that data that comes in, the more we can correlate um, what's actually out there in the wild. Um, so we can see that you know these five tests, um, we only have five results in the entire repository that they passed on. Um, that tells us that that's probably a, a poor capability. Um, opinions are good, um, but they're opinions, right? So just because me, a vendor, doesn't want to implement something or it doesn't work well with my product or whatever it is, um, is not necessarily a reason that it shouldn't be interoperable, right? If the whole rest of the world is doing this and I'm not, I'm not interoperable by, de by definition, right? So I'm going to be out of compliance with the spec, and I either need to fix that or decide I'm not going to be called OpenSAC. Um, that said, opinions are valid data points for us. Um, so especially if they're backed with some rationale, like not just I don't like floating IPs, but I can't use them because X, Y, Z. Um, so feel free to submit opinions. Um, just be careful to recognize that uh, they are what they are. All right, so now we get to the point about how to actually supply feedback. Um, there's a review. Um, all that review says right now is the one line change that changed that uh, spec we showed earlier from uh, review status to approved status. That won't actually land until January at the earliest when this goes up before the board. But in the meantime, that review is a good place to collect all kinds of feedback. Uh, so that's where people can chime in and say, you know, we need X, Y, or Z. Uh, we don't like this capability. We don't like that capability. That's also where, in future patch sets, we may drop some of those capabilities. So I think someone actually already submitted a patch this morning to drop floating IPs out of it. Um, so you know, that's, that's a good place to uh, sort of funnel feedback. Um, you can also grab me or one of the other DEF Corps committee members in the hallway. You can grab one of the TC members in the hallway uh, and talk their ears off about it. Um, I think my email is actually somewhere in the slide, so um, I'll leave you to find it. Um, operators meetups, we try to stay uh, in touch with the operator community as well. Um, so if you're attending those sessions, then those are good places as well. Um, we rely pretty heavily on the user survey when we're looking at things like what uh, toolkits and client APIs people are using. Um, so if you look at the most recent user survey results, I think um, LibCloud, JCloud, and Ruby, uh, what was the other one? Fog were the three most common uh, API toolkits that people are using. Um, that gives us good data because if we find out that you know 60% of people that are using and something other than the OpenStack clients are using those three things, we can go look at those three things and say, wow, that one doesn't support Glance V2 at all. Um, so maybe that's a strike against Glance V2 going into all the guidelines. Um, so please answer the user survey if you can. Um, I already mentioned Restack. Um, and if you're working on over a Neutron uh, in one of those technical communities, a good place to give feedback is within that technical community as well. A um, couple of resources. There, like I say, we'll post these slides later. Um, if you're new to DEF Core, there's kind of a 101 deck um, that you can go look at. Um, there's also uh, some links to our published criteria, uh, the definitions that we use when we're talking about things like what a capability actually is. Um, the guideline itself, uh, and then the previous guidelines as well, if you want to see what's uh, board approved today and what uh, products bearing the logo uh, actually have to expose today. Um, I think that is about it. Uh, so we've got a couple minutes for questions, if anybody has any. Yeah. Right. So generally speaking, um, API extensions are not something that we put in the guidelines because they are very frequently optional. Um, in Neutron's case, like all kinds of stuff is extensions. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, true. It's actually like super widely deployed. Yeah, I think that uh, that particular concept yeah. of extensions in Neutron isn't isn't really a good yeah. uh, indicator of where the line is between what's like in reality like a core feature versus right. uh, a more uh, well, I'll say less used feature, and uh, so that's just that's a pr really good example of that. It, it it turns out to be it seems like it's more of an implementation detail than a something that really communicates something that's you know required or not. I mean, I know yeah. So I mean, ultimately, it comes down to what people are actually deploying in the wild. Um, yeah. Generally speaking, extensions aren't widely deployed in a lot of cases. Um, in cases like and there are other projects too. Um, Neutron is yeah. the only one, but in Neutron's case. Some of those extensions really are very widely deployed. OpenStack, more generally, and some, you know, some of the other projects have started this, and Neutron's talked about it quite a bit, but hasn't implemented it yet. Is this idea of getting rid of extensions because it's confusing for this exact reason, and um, just making you know, this is the API. It may be that that feature is disabled, and when you try to use it, uh, you know, it, it may just you know reject the request, and and hopefully we even make it discoverable about what may be you know, disabled or whatever the case may be. But getting rid of that idea of extensions because it's actually painful for everybody. So. I think that's really kind of the direction that uh, that the OpenStack's going overall. 
Anybody else? Mm-hmm. You can do so in that case because you were mentioning that you wanted people to really be using it, like you didn't want them to go off and like re implement the whole thing sure. like Java. But in that case, you, you certainly could, right? Yeah. You could just keep supporting yeah. some subset of the API, and I guess as long as that subset includes the things that you put in this spec, yeah. then it's all good. Is that basically so? Um, every, almost every OpenStack project has, is an abstraction over something. Right. Uh, in Neutron's case, what they extract is a bunch of different kinds of ways to do networking. It could be physical switches with VLANs. It could be SDN controllers. It could be whatever else. Right. Um, stuff that goes into the drivers is how um, that specific thing under the hood realizes the concept that you're asking for. So when I say get me a network, um, what I'm actually doing might be you know, provisioning VLANs on a switch. It might be setting up uh, open flow tables. Um, you know, it could be any number of other things. Yeah. That, that yeah. So, right. so the way to the way to think about yeah the way to think about neutron conceptually is sort of it's it's, it's kind of like two pieces if we kind of really zoom out right so there's the API layer there's the, there's the common implementation of the API that exposes the concepts to end users and right. administrators that are common to in theory common to to whatever the back end is that you've chosen and then there's the the, the back end drivers that are sort of invisible to the end user that implement that. So, but the, the part that's required like for this is that top layer. So that everyone standardizes on that top API layer, the, the code and the API itself. Right. And then it's, you know, your choice of, uh, of how uh, the back end. Yeah. And to the point, um, you know, it is possible that vendor, like if I'm running a public cloud, for example, um, I might implement Neutron, have these APIs, and then also have some other APIs that I expose via other means that are not Neutron. That's fine. This doesn't prevent me from doing that. But I have to expose the ones that DevCore requires. The implication generally being that you know, most providers are probably not going to choose to have to offer two ways to do the same thing, um, because that's a hassle for them. Um, it's possible some might. But as an OpenStack user, I can depend on that one being there. Anybody else? Um, so the way it generally starts out is the DEF core committee itself starts doing its own homework um, about what they think is widely deployed. We look at the user surveys. We look at what's supported in uh, client toolkits and those kind of things. Um, step two is we kind of like draft a straw man proposal and go talk to the PTLs. Um, and the PTLs generally bring in some of the other technical community members. Um, we also generally bounce those kind of things off of end users as well. Um, that eventually makes its way into a, a patch, uh, literally a review in Garrett that people can go comment on. Um, and that actually provides the scores for each one of those 12 capability. We say, yes, this is widely deployed. Yes, this is used by tools. Yes, this is used by clients. Um, that goes up for debate, um, and people are welcome to comment on it. Um, we are going to start rolling up to both the TC and the user committee kind of a, a report of that uh, every, every cycle as well. Um, and through that feedback process there, um, that's what eventually goes into the standard that we present to the board. Once we do that, and it's in that proposed standard, um, then it kind of gets wide publicity. Like, I'm sure in a week or two, you're going to see a blog on Superuser about this, and some emails to the ML and that kind of thing. Um, so that's the that kind of starts that uh, three month period where stuff can be thrown out before the board even gets to vote on it. Um, and then once that's done, obviously we have the six month advisory period as well. Make sense? Um, so yeah, we should talk about pressure relief valves. Um, so there's a couple of those. Um, if there's a capability that is required and there's good reason for it not to be required, um, there's a thing that we can do called flagging a test. Um, the reasons that we would do that are like we screwed up on the scoring and it actually isn't widely deployed and we thought it was. Or maybe Tempest is broken and that test just won't actually ever pass for anybody. right? Um, so once we flag a test, then it's not required for the rest of that guideline. Um, we may drop that flag in the next cycle. Like if it's a Tempest bug and the bug gets fixed, then we'll drop the flag, right? Um, we do eventually retire capabilities from DEF Core, and the way we do that is um, by deprecating them. So just like with any, any API in OpenStack, uh, there's a deprecation cycle, and we'll kind of do the same thing. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, the project will choose to discontinue something. Like you know, we may require Glance v2 today, uh, and Glance decides to write a new API and deprecate the old one. 
Um, so as a lagging indicator, we'll generally follow the projects. Uh, so when a project says this thing is deprecated, uh, that's the point where we'll probably deprecate it from the, the guideline. Yeah, the nice thing about, about removing things is if you think about it in terms of like these being requirements on a vendor or, 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 or someone providing a product is it's, you're really making, you're actually making their job easier when you remove something. So there's like less controversy about that, I think. I mean, it's, it's a step back away from interoperability and a larger set of things that you can count on. So there's a, there's a bad side to it, but in terms of the people that you're holding accountable and saying you must be able to do this to be able to use the OpenStack name and logo, like they're not going to argue with you making it easier on them, um, so which is kind of nice. But uh, so that's why you kind of you see a much more um, you know robust process around adding things because that's raising the bar and that puts pressure on everybody and it's great for the whole community. But uh, you know that that's increased pressure, so that's why you, they, there's a whole lot of focus on the process for adding things. Anybody else? Okay, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you very much.